This happened when I lived in Hachioji. I was in university at the time. I moved to Tokyo from Chiba. I lived in three different places when I moved to Tokyo, and this experience takes place in the second apartment I moved into. I found an apartment I liked. The building was pretty old, but it had just been renovated. The structure and layout of the apartment was really unique, so as soon as I viewed it, I expressed my interest to the realtor and then I contracted it. I had a girlfriend and she moved in with me. Now let me just explain the layout of that apartment. It was on the second floor of the building and in the corner. It was strange and cool because I had my own personal staircase. It was connected to my apartment. There was also a parking spot just below this private staircase which made life easy. If you open the front door, you'll see the toilet on your right and the kitchen just down the hall behind it on the right. There are stairs on the left and the entrance to the living room next to them. If you head up the stairs, you'll find a door leading to the attic, and I really like the attic. So, like I said, the floor plan was pretty unusual, but it was cool. However, shortly after moving in, the weird goings-on began. My girlfriend loved the place as much as I did. One day, we were sat in the lounge drinking booze, watching some TV, and then we both heard the sound of the door handle. My girlfriend instantly went to panic mode, and she was super freaked out. I tried to laugh it off and said something like, Chill out, it's probably just the wind. I'd be lying if I said that my heart wasn't beating as fast as it possibly could in my chest. I was just trying to stay calm and composed. It definitely sounded like the door. A couple of seconds later, the sound came again. This time, she started to really panic, and she was close to tears. What kind of man or boyfriend would I be if I didn't go and check it out? So... I told her to wait there while I went to go see where the noise was coming from. I was bricking it, it was really stressful. I came out of the lounge and faced the front door, and I saw something. I saw what was causing the noise. Before my eyes, the front door handle was moving up and down, like if there was someone outside trying the door to gain entrance. Panic had settled in for me now as the door handle rattled and the door moved, it sounded like there was some real force behind it. I realized that the door wasn't locked, and as that thought came to me, the door flew open. I expected to see some masked knife-wielding maniac, but there was no one out there. That particular fear slowly fizzled away, and I called out to my girlfriend. Oh, hey, don't worry, it's just some garbage blown by the wind outside. It's making some noise. I lied to her in an attempt to reassure her. Despite no one being behind that door, I still felt terrified. The things which are unseen are the most frightening, I think. The things which defy logic and reason are truly the most frightening. I decided to try and forget about it and carry on, kind of drink away my problems. I'm not that good at drinking. Is that the right way to phrase it? I'm kind of weak. I get drunk easily and always end up feeling sick. And that day was really strange though. I didn't drink much but I began to almost hyperventilate, like my breathing got fast. I felt hazy and dull, it was as if I was looking through a yellow filter. Everything had this yellowish tinge to it, and something was definitely wrong. I felt as if I would either faint or die. No, I'm not being melodramatic, things escalated really quickly. I sat there panicking silently and internally until I could bear it no longer. I turned to my girlfriend and asked through labored breathing for her to call an ambulance. She called and the ambulance arrived and I was taken to the hospital. While in hospital, I was informed that I had suffered from hyperventilation, which they assumed was likely brought on by some sort of stressor. He said that my symptoms had already begun to subside. And as you know... I was just at home sitting around drinking, so how on earth did I suddenly start to stress myself out? I didn't feel stressed anymore, so I just asked to leave and we called a taxi to take us home. Well, I was pretty concerned and that hadn't ever happened to me before, so I called my mom and asked her opinion. I'll digress for just a second and tell you about my mom. She has always believed that she has had the power to sense the presence of spirits. I mean, I don't think that I have such an ability, I'm half dumb. I didn't expect her to say what she said, though. She says, That sounds like the early symptoms of possession, so you need to be really careful. And that really creeped me out. 
the hyperventilation turned out to be a regular thing. I learned how to manage it a bit better with each bout, but I decided that I didn't want to live in that apartment anymore. Something was terribly wrong there. I tried to get out as soon as possible. My girlfriend was in agreement as she wanted to leave too, and she could see that something was affecting me. I tried to stay out of that apartment as much as I could. As soon as my classes finished, I would try and find other things to do outside to keep me busy. I would go and play the slots now and then. I was never interested in the slots before, and I don't play them anymore. It was a strange sort of lived hobby. After that, I would go and pick my girlfriend up from her office job and then head home. About a month went by from the incident with that door, and then one evening we came back to the apartment. Like I said before, there was a spot right near the stairs which I always liked to park in. However, when we got back, there was a bunch of people in the parking lot. I noticed that one of them was a monk and all the others were wearing mourning attire. There were bouquets of flowers and lit incense sticks. It was a pretty strange sight to see. My girlfriend and I felt a little panicked. We parked away from them in a different spot and headed over to ask what the hell was going on. And the monk then smiled at me and replied, Oh, don't worry. Things are going fine now. Please, don't worry. I didn't understand. I asked him to explain exactly what he meant and then a woman in her 50s stepped forward. I think I can explain. My husband ended things here. I'm so sorry. And my mouth hung open. Apparently her husband had taken his life in our apartment only a few days before we moved in. And I was stunned but I asked, why are you doing this now then? The monk then said that there was a shared belief that the woman's husband hadn't passed over, but now, with the help of the mourners here today and the ritual that he had performed, he believed that man's spirit was now at peace. I wasn't certain that I could trust if the spirit of that man was truly at peace. What I felt in those bouts of hyperventilation was incredibly profound levels of fear, the likes of which I didn't want to experience again. So despite the reassurances of the monk, I complained to the landlord and moved out. I am happy to say that the hyperventilation episode stopped instantly and my girlfriend and I live a much more comfortable life now. I heard this story from one of my mountain climbing friends. He is really into mountain climbing and has climbed and conquered many in his time and I'm part of the same club as he is. He told me about this one club that he did where he had to pay at this parking spot a kind of toll to climb. He said that the guy who had paid took down his address and information in case of an emergency. He arrived at 8am which is way later than usual for him. He was climbing alone that day and he was preparing himself. The elevation was high, but since he knew that he would be starting late, he decided before arriving that he'd spend the night at the summit. The guy who took payment from him told him that there was an unmanned cabin up there which he would be more than welcome to use. He liked that idea more than his tent. He felt like because of that he could really take his time and enjoy the climbing experience. He climbed to the summit without incident and took in all the gorgeous views. He was the only one at the summit and the cabin was empty. He brewed some coffee, looked out over the mountain at nature's splendor and watched the sunset as evening arrived. It started to get darker and chillier so he headed into the cabin. He brought some alcohol with him and had a little drink while preparing dinner and listening to the radio. He was really tired after dinner, drinking and hiking and all that, and he decided to head to bed and get some sleep so he could start his descent early in the morning. He turned off the lantern and the cabin was plunged into darkness. He said that he had no issue falling asleep due to his tiredness. In the middle of the night, he awoke to a strange sound. It sounded like the door was rattling. It spooked him a bit because when he checked the weather forecast, it didn't seem like it was going to be a particularly windy night. He listened closely to the sound and soon realized that it wasn't the sound of the wind. It was something else. It sounded to him like the sound of someone trying the door and the sound of people walking around. 
You know when you are in the dark and you're groping for something, like the door handle? He said it sounded just like that. A quick look at his watch told him that it was past 2 a.m. He didn't think that another climber would be attempting the mountain at this time of night in the dark. Could there really be anyone out there that late? I know that some mountains are connected by ranges and you can hike or climb from one to another, but that mountain wasn't like this. For one, you needed to pay the toll at the parking lot, and secondly, there wasn't another mountain in the area. It was just one mountain with one climbing route. So he said based on what he knew and his experience, there should be no one out there. He said it was impossible, and that terrified him. He lay in his sleeping bag, shaking. He couldn't summon up the courage to leave it, and he pretended to be asleep but kept his eyes slightly open, waiting and hoping the noise from outside the cabin door would stop or go away. His hopes weren't answered. After a few moments, he heard the sound of the door creaking open, and the sound was deafening. He said he was praying deep within his heart when he heard that sound. Sweat had begun to form on his brow and his shaking showed no sign of subsiding. He opened his eyes slightly wider and he said that he saw four figures by the open door illuminated by the light of a shadowy moon. A boy, a girl, a man and a woman. They were wearing tattered and torn clothing. They carried no flashlights or lanterns with them and they seemed to be completely used to the dark. They entered the cabin. My friend closed his eyes and prayed and prayed that they go away. He was terrified of this family. They defied all logic that he put his faith into. There was no way that they could be there, yet there they were, and now they were in the cabin with him. He heard footsteps creeping around the wooden flooring. They appeared to be looking for something. Agonizing seconds crawled by, and my friend stayed as still as he could to not alert them to his presence. Then, just as quickly as they had arrived, they left without conversation and without closing the cabin door. He said that as soon as he saw them go, he lost consciousness. I think he may have fainted through fear. And as soon as he woke, he hurriedly threw all of his things into his bag and began his descent. I'm not sure if he checked if anything was missing or not, but that would have been one of the first things that I would have done. He got dressed and quickly prepped for the descent. He went down the mountain as fast as he could, and he was still terrified by his nightly visitors. He didn't want to see them in the day. There was something about that family that truly terrified him. When he got to the bottom, he spoke to the man at the toll booth and told him about his experience. He said it wouldn't have been right not to mention what happened. He didn't care if it made him look dumb or scared. The toll booth guy told him that he was the only one on the mountain that night and that disturbed him. He wondered if he was visited by spirits. The toll booth guy then said a few months back a family did go missing on that mountain and no sign of them had been found. Was it their spirits visiting him or was the family still living? I wonder if they were looking for some food or something and were drawn to the hut. Perhaps something happened to them and they have memory loss or something. I don't know. My friend is convinced that the family that visited the cabin were spirits. He'll never forget that night in the cabin. In all his climbs and hikes, he has never experienced the paranormal again. Whenever I sleep outside of my normal bedroom, you know, like in a hotel somewhere like that, I hear this strange sound. It almost sounds like someone sighing or exhaling. It's somewhere in the room, but I can never find out where it's coming from. It sounds like there is someone else sleeping in the room with me. I can hear this noise if the lights are on and still cannot find the source of the noise. It's just really strange. I have tried taking photos and videos with my smartphone, but when I play them back, I get nothing. I turn the lights off, squint, and wait for my eyes to become adjusted to the darkness, and sometimes I feel like there is something amidst the darkness. I can't be sure, though. It feels like there is something in the room with me now and then, some shape in the dark, and the feeling is quite creepy. I get worried whenever I hear that sighing that exhaling noise and it becomes impossible to ignore it. 
I first noticed it last September, and once I heard it, there was no way to unhear it. I travel a lot for work, and my company seems to have this wonderful skill where they are able to locate the cheapest and most out-of-the-way hotels that money can buy. I guess maybe sleeping in all these rundown motels and hotels could have created this nervousness, and maybe I am imagining things. Well, that was what I thought, until the other night. I heard the same sound at home, the one place that I hadn't heard it before. It happened when I came home late from work. I remember I bought pasta that night, and I was eating it at the kitchen table. My whole family was sleeping. My eyes were really dry, so I reached for the eye drops and put a drop in each eye, and I'm still sat at the kitchen table at this point. I then heard that strange sighing sound. I wanted to open my eyes, but since I had just put the drops in them, I couldn't open them straight away. So I slowly opened my right eye, only a little bit, and I looked around the kitchen, and of course, like always, there was nothing there. It was new. Like I said, I had only heard it when I was away from my home, but that night I heard it in my home. Now I was annoyed. I wanted some answers. I wasn't in a hotel. I was at home so I could investigate as much as I'd like, and that's what I did. I looked around the kitchen, but the sound wasn't coming from there. Maybe it was coming from the hallway. No. Over towards the back door, perhaps. No. I couldn't find it. I was really straining my ears while I was searching. I felt like the sound was definitely in the kitchen. I left the room and walked back in to reset or get fresh ears. Is that even a phrase? I don't know. As soon as I re-entered the kitchen, I heard the sound and it sounded like it was coming from somewhere close to the refrigerator. The thought that it was just a mechanical noise and I had too many late nights crossed my mind and until I heard the sound mixed in with the dull hum of the refrigerator. It's here. I know it's around here, I thought as I bent over searching. The sound was louder for the first time, and it felt like I was actually getting closer. And with that in mind, I decided to hit the lights to see if it made a difference. Usually, I need some time to allow my eyes to adjust to the darkness, and that's when I feel like I can almost see something. But that night, something was different my left eye. I could see very clearly from that eye in the dark. I guess it was because I kept my left eye shut while I was searching around the kitchen, and this was interesting. My vision seemed to improve more with my right eye shut too. After a few moments, I saw two white dots emerge out of the darkness. I quickly realized that these were the whites of someone's eyes. Then I could see that the pupils of those eyes were dark, almost black. These eyes in the darkness were looking directly at me. I gasped in shock. I had never seen anything like that before. I kept looking, and I couldn't stop, and to my surprise I could see the figure of someone, the owner of those eyes. It looked as if though they were tied up, their limbs were clearly bound. The mouth wasn't really visible. I realized why. There was tape over their mouth. The sound that I was hearing was the inhalation and exhalation through their nose, and I could sense that there was no panic in this person, there was just some aura of hopeless acceptance. They were not fighting against their situation, and the atmosphere in the darkness of my kitchen was that of pure desolation and surrender. The steady, patient exhales and inhales continued, and I could only watch in stunned horror. I couldn't move. After a few moments, I couldn't tell you how many, the figure of the bound person appeared to become blurry, and then it faded into the darkness. To this day, I have no idea why this person, or perhaps should I say apparition, appeared to me. I haven't heard the breathing again in my home, and... I really wish I knew more about that poor soul, and I wonder if I ever hear it again. Next week, I'll be going on another business trip, and I will do the same things that I did last time in an attempt to see the bound person again. I'll use my eye drops and get accustomed to the dark. Perhaps I will see them again. I'm not sure. I am both excited and terrified.
This happened before a national holiday not too long ago. I didn't have school the next day, and that's always a cause for celebration, but I was up kind of late for my age as it was about 10.30. I was in high school back then, and I will just have to quickly explain my family dynamic because it'll make sense later. My father passed away when I was younger. My mom works all the time and I live with my grandparents. That night my granddad was out and my grandma was downstairs somewhere. I was studying for exams, high pressure stuff that I was supposed to care about massively for some reason. I was more interested in my music back then to be honest, and I used to listen to my tunes through the PSP. I was taking a break from studying, you know, just giving my eyes a rest, so I set my PSP down and I leaned back on my chair and shut my eyes for a second. I opened them and then looked at my bedroom door. I noticed something, and it sent my head into a spin. I saw something weird. It was like the figure of a person. A person who wasn't a family member. It was just this shadowy shape peering at me around the door of the room across the hall. Across the hall was an empty room, and there was no logical reason why that shadow should be cast in that room. I first thought that my mom or grandma had left the window open to air out the house, and I was seeing a very human-looking curtain position or said curtain being caught on the balcony or something. It seemed highly implausible, especially since the way it seemed to be leering around the door to look at me. It was no trick of the light. I watched that shadow then emerge from the spare room and enter the hallway. It was like it was fixated on me, and even though it was dark I could tell by the movements of that thing that it was facing me. It crept around the door in the hallway with its back against the door and the hallway wall. I then watched it as it slowly backed off towards the stairs and before I could see it descend the stairs, it disappeared. And here's the weird thing. It looked like it was the same height as me and, by its silhouette, it looked like it had the same hair and clothes that I had. It's really hard to explain. Now, like I said, it was just my grandma and I in that house at the time. She didn't go upstairs much because she had bad hips. But if it was her, I would recognize her silhouette and surely she would hit a light or something. I was left there in my chair, shuddering, trying to understand what I had just witnessed. What does it mean? Something that kind of looked like me was watching me from the other room. And why and for what purpose? Was this some kind of spirit or shadow person? Did it leave because I spotted it? What would have happened if I didn't notice its presence? I was just horrified. When my brain searched and searched for logical answers and came back with none, it was just as terrifying. I started to freak out a bit and then I thought, what if it comes back? I didn't want to go downstairs because that was the last place that I saw that thing head off to. I still have no idea what the hell that was and I lived in that house right up until I moved out and feared that I would see that shadowy figure again, but thankfully I didn't. I did wonder if it could have been a home intruder. Maybe I guess. I was young. Maybe I didn't know. But I don't know though. I think I would have seen some features of that invader or their clothes, and I don't think it was that. I never told anyone in my family about what happened that night because I was worried that they would just laugh at me and call me weak. I didn't want my mom to worry about me when she was out working so many hours, and I do wonder if they would have believed me sometimes. This happened about five years ago while I was living with my parents. I remember that I was ill when it happened. I think I had a cold or a fever or something. I was lying in bed in the morning not feeling well. It was about 8am when I heard my mother call out to me that I'm going to work now. If you get any sicker, give me a call. Back then we had a cat and it was just me and the cat at home. That cat kept coming in and out of my room and was really annoying. I couldn't get back to sleep. I had had enough of the cat so I got out of bed and put him out of the room and just shut the door. Because my parents house is really old, if you don't lock the door then the cat knows that he can just push against it to get back into my room, so I locked it. It was a simple bolt lock. 
I got back into bed, but I couldn't get to sleep as my body felt very heavy and very cold. My vision was shaking too, and I'm not sure if this makes sense, but I can't think of a better description. I felt very strange. I wanted to call my mom to tell her that I was getting worse, but I couldn't get a phone signal for some reason. I was starting to get more and more anxious, and that anxiety grew when I heard my cat meowing outside my bedroom door. It was like a low meow, this sort of ma, you know. There was something strange about that meow, though. It played on my mind for a few minutes, and then I figured out what was wrong. The meow sounded like it was coming from a high place, not a low place. It sounded like the cat was at head height rather than foot height, and this really scared me. I didn't know how it could be possible. There was no way that the cat could be on something that high. We didn't have any furniture near the door. I kept silent and didn't go anywhere near that door. And after a while, I heard my mother's voice. Are you okay? I came back from work because I was worried about you. It was my mother's voice, I'm sure of it, but there was something just wrong enough about the voice that caused me to mistrust it. There was some subtle differences like tone and word choice something that was slightly different than usual. Another thing that didn't add up was the fact that she had only left for work about two hours ago, so why would she be back? If she wanted to check on me, she would have just waited until lunchtime. I only had the flu or something, it wasn't like a life-threatening situation. And I didn't like it. I knew something was wrong. The way the cat sounded like it was at head height, and the way my mom sounded so much like my mom, but off was enough to make me frightened. I was so cold that my teeth were chattering. I stared at the door and my body felt too heavy to move. I was just sitting there, cold and scared. I knew something was about to happen before it did. The door handle began to violently turn over and over. The lock was so old that it wouldn't take much to break that door down. and My teeth kept chattering and I could even see my breath fog in front of me. My body stiffened. After a few moments, my teeth stopped chattering and I was silent. Then, I felt that presence that was on the other side of the door had left. Whatever that something was, was gone. I was able to move again, so I reached for my smartphone and called my mom. And the signal was back. I was really scared and potentially blubbering as I asked her, Mom, did you j just come home right now? She said, what are you talking about? I'm still at work. Are you alright? I said I was just feeling worse and I had a bad dream. I stayed in my room until she came back during her lunch break and I was utterly terrified. Sadly, when my mother came home, she found out that our cat was dead, lying at the foot of my door. There were no visible injuries to the cat and the poor thing wasn't ill or old. He had been running around happily only a few hours ago. He was just lying dead there on his side. I wonder if he was taken by that something that was trying to get into my room. I wonder what might have happened to me if I thought that it truly was my mom on the other side of the door. And I think my cat may have saved my life. I have looked for an explanation of what happened to me for years and I'd like to share with you some of my findings. It seems as if pets aren't the only victims of whatever visited my house that day. Demons target the young, the elderly, or the sick. They go for the weakest of the house. And this caused ill-prone people to become scapegoats in the past. There are suggestions that on some level people subconsciously realize that there is nothing that they own to ward off evil spirits and misfortune, and that is why they end up wanting a pet. If a pet prematurely dies, it can mean that there is something demonic lurking. I guess that's the reason why witches kept black cats. I don't know. These are just my theories based on my terrifying experience. This took place at the end of January. I work as a mountain ranger and after I had finished the sweep of the mountain, I was on my way back down to close the main gate. A strong northerly wind blew the powdery snow down below the left of the valley. It looked like a miniature snowstorm. 
It was interesting, so I stopped and watched it from my vantage point. I noticed something close to that snowstorm, the figure of a person. They were standing there, watching the snowstorm too. Since it was getting late and cold, I went down to speak with them. I drew closer to the figure and as I did, I heard that whoever was there was talking. It sounded like someone was having a conversation. The person's voice was only audible during the pause of the wind's relentless howling. The figure was speaking to someone, I was sure of it. The only issue was is that I couldn't see who it was they were speaking to. I wondered if someone was hurt or lost and I got a little concerned. As I got closer I discovered that I recognized that person. The snow and lack of light had been obscuring my view. I knew that guy. He lived on my street. We used to be good friends at school. I called out to him, Hey, what the hell are you doing out here? I was even laughing when I said it, and when I called out to him, he slowly turned to face me. He had a very sober and stern look on his face, as usual. Hey, what are you talking about? He replied to me. Huh? It looked like you were speaking to someone just then. Uh, I don't see anyone out here. Who were you talking to? Oh, I was just speaking to Shoda. What? I stood there stunned for a moment or two. I didn't expect him to say that. Shoda was his son. And sadly, his boy passed away from childhood cancer at the age of seven, just on the cusp of spring. The loss of his son hadn't taken a visible toll on him. In fact... That was the first time he mentioned his boy's name since the funeral. He didn't seem to have changed much after his son passed, except he was very quiet, to the point where he wouldn't say a thing. If we were ever at an event or party, he would just sit somewhere off to the side and keep quiet with a very solemn look on his face. This wasn't that different from how he was before his son's passing. I never saw him grieve. Even at Shota's funeral, he kept silent. He was just watching as his poor wife bawled her eyes out. He looked up and appeared to glare at the attendees. He stared at us all like we were his enemies. Seeing him like that, I guessed that he was struggling internally with his emotions, or at least he didn't want to show everyone how he was feeling. It could have been pride or shame. I am guessing, though. Who am I to say how he was feeling? It just looked to me like he was suppressing it all, burying his pain. It was nine months after the funeral that I saw him out in my mountain range talking to the biting wind. I was just out for a walk. I really like it here. I heard a voice and it felt as if though I was being called by someone. I turned to see who it was and then I saw Shota standing there. I listened to the man. I didn't know what else I could do. The wind died down and the whole mountain range fell eerily silent. It felt to me like time had stood still, like the mountains wanted to hear his story too. Shota, you know what he said to me? Don't be mean to mom. I knew that he could be mean. My wife had overheard him scolding his son before he passed. He apparently kept telling the boy, don't cry. Nothing gets solved by crying. That should give you an idea of who he is. Everyone knows everything in small towns, and word travels fast. I know I can be a horrible person sometimes. I don't mean to be. I guess I can't help it sometimes. It sounded like he was truly complimenting the advice that his son gave him from beyond the grave. I looked away and then back and... Shota was gone. He tilted his head back and stared upwards towards the sky. He kept on talking, unusually loud for him. It really worried me, you know, to be pleaded to and preached to by my son after I hadn't seen him in so long. I feel angry. I feel pity. I feel a lot of things right now. I don't know what to feel. He kind of just trailed off, but continued to stare at the sky. Grief. What a terrible thing that is. You know me. I rarely cry, but look at me now. I wonder when these tears will stop flowing. Tears were cascading down his face. 
white puffs of exhalation plumed with every sob, and the pain in that man's heart must have been unbelievable. Before long, his cheeks were wet. Then, the guy howled, literally from the pit of his stomach. It was as if it was all coming out of him. His tears were falling, and I watched as they slipped silently down through the snow. Just off to the side of the spot, I saw the tears. I saw two indentations in the powdered snow. One set, one set of footprints which undoubtedly could only belong to a child. Before long, a sharp gust signaled the return of the wind and it began to whip up again and the footprints were buried under the freshly blown snow. They were gone. They were gone physically, but I don't think he would ever forget them. They must have been burned into his memories. We both descended the mountain as the sun waned and when we got to the bottom and I saw him in the fluorescent light of the street lamps, I saw that stony, sullen expression begin to lift. I didn't see that expression again after that. And I always think back to that experience when the first snow of winter begins to lift and the ice begins to thaw, just like the ice in his heart. This is a really unusual story that someone told me at college during a party. I found it quite intriguing and I'd like to share it with you. This guy's parents got divorced when he was just a baby and he was raised exclusively by his mother. Unfortunately, his mother couldn't afford to send him to nursery school so he spent a lot of time home alone. That's a difficult situation but it gets even more peculiar. One day his mother came home earlier than usual from work and walked in on him talking to someone. She rushed over to her son, expecting to protect him from a possible intruder, but what she saw was him speaking aloud to an empty apartment. He was smiling, giggling, and conversing with something unseen. As this little boy grew into the young adult who shared this story with me, he admitted that he doesn't remember much about those times, but he does recall that there was, in his words, something like a black shadow in the empty apartment with him. He mentioned that the black shadow was always around him. It may sound horrifying, but he assured me that it wasn't a frightening experience. To him, the shadow was like an extra parent. Whenever he was alone, he heard kind words from it, and he even mentioned that the shadow played with him. Despite his father not being in the picture at the time, he seemed to consider the black shadow as a father figure, and his hopeful childhood heart was glad of the company. He shared that his mother started keeping a closer eye on him after this revelation, perhaps with a heavy heart, reflecting on her previous neglect. Eventually, he mentioned that the black shadow disappeared, and with a chuckle, he said that it didn't disappear for too long. He still sees the shadow from time to time, especially during important life events. Even though he doesn't see it every day, he feels its presence. As a child, he was never scared of dark, shadowy areas, such as under the bed or open closets at night. He welcomed them, and to this day, he continues to look for the shadow and sometimes he sees it. Although he shared this story with a smile on his face, I couldn't help but feel that the smile was tinged with a hint of loneliness. It's something to think about. Perhaps not all shadowy figures are malevolent. I live in an apartment that was built in 1989. Now let me go over the layout of the apartment because it's important. It's a pretty standard place, but it has a loft. It's not that big, to be honest. It's a little cramped in there. I don't really like my loft. I find it kind of, I don't know, creepy. There's a certain sense of vulnerability that comes with having a loft. I can't quite explain it, but by the end of this story, you'll know why they frighten me. It all started with a feeling one night after work, and I haven't been able to shake this feeling. As soon as I come through the door, the first thing that I see is my loft. I get the feeling that sometimes something is watching me from up there. At first, I just thought it was my tired mind conjuring up something. I've been tired before, you know, but this just felt different. Little did I know, 
a grudge was born that day. Now let me give you a point of view when you're in bed in the loft. If you naturally look out or down, you'd see the entryway leading to the kitchen. Now, naturally when I sleep, I sleep on my side and therefore I face the entryway to the kitchen. Sometimes before sleep comes for me, I get the strong feeling that someone is looking at me, staring at me from down there in the entranceway. In uneasy times like that, I try to read or get myself to sleep as soon as possible. I turn off the lights so I don't get distracted, and I just use a little night light near my pillow to read my book. However, one night, a deeper sense of unease crept over me. I felt as if something was wrong. I heard a noise coming from down below, and the lights were off down there. I listened carefully, and it sounded as if someone was exhaling. It definitely sounded like breathing. The second my mind understood that I was hearing breathing, I stayed deathly still. I was horrified. My heart began to pound in my chest. I thought that there was an intruder in my home. The air in the room felt heavy and oppressive. It enveloped me. It was all around me. The room seemed to grow darker and I felt strange. I could still hear that noise. It resounded around the room below. It sounded closer, and beneath the loft there was a blind spot, but I felt as if I pinpointed the spot where the breathing sound was coming from. Someone was down there, with their back against the wall. I managed to convince myself of that. When I imagined that, I shuddered, drew my shoulders up to my chin, and held my covers tight. It was like a stalemate. I couldn't do anything, and the feeling that there was someone down there wouldn't go away. After a moment or two, the breathing sound suddenly stopped. I thought that it was all over, that I had imagined the whole thing, and relief washed over me. Then, in that moment, I heard a familiar sound, a sound that I had heard many times before. It was the instantly recognizable sound of someone climbing the ladder which leads to the loft. It sounded exactly like someone was coming up the ladder towards me. I was frozen with fear, and again I was unable to move. My mind was a mess of fear and worry as I heard the sound of someone climbing up. Clarity came to me swiftly though. I guess this is what they call fight or flight. I made up my mind to deal with whoever was coming up to me. The sound continued, and I was certain that I would see someone's head emerge in a matter of seconds. Those seconds came and went, and although they felt as if though they were hours, the tension was unbearable. Nothing came into view and then the sound stopped. It stopped at the top of the ladder. If someone was on that ladder, I should have seen them. It sounded like whatever came up that ladder was now in the loft with me. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was sure that there wasn't an intruder in the house. And as soon as that thought crossed my mind, my nightlight went out and I was plunged into absolute darkness. Then, close to my ear, I heard three words that chilled me to the core. Who are you? I cannot remember much after this point. I guess I may have fainted from fright. It was morning when I opened my eyes again. I don't know why, but I don't really feel the need to pursue or search for the meaning or explanation of this experience. I'm debating whether or not to move out, and I feel like it could just be the beginning of something. There is something definitely bad in my apartment, and I don't think I'll be able to stand if something like that happens again. I heard this from my aunt. She worked in a hospital her whole career. As you can imagine, she has seen and experienced a lot. One night, my aunt told me about when she first became a nurse. She said that the hardest part of her job was the night shift. The way she described her job and her duties made it sound like she was incredibly busy. She had to make regular rounds all throughout the night and respond to patients and the sudden changes in their condition. She found it hard to adjust to the night shift since her body was used to sleeping while she would be working, but on top of that, 
She said that being largely alone in a dark hospital at night was very creepy. She felt like this as a new nurse and figured that she would just adjust eventually. One night she was making her rounds along the dark hospital ward. She would look in on the patients as she passed by to see how they were. When she arrived at one room on the third floor, she noticed a patient sitting upright, staring blankly at the window. The patient was an elderly man in his 80s. The elderly man noticed that my aunt was standing in the doorway of his room watching him, so he called out, Isn't Nozaki-san on night duty tonight? He never turned away from looking out the window, but since it was dark, my aunt could see his face in the reflection, and he seemed to be grinning. My aunt then encouraged him to lie back down on the bed and get some rest. It wasn't the first time that she had heard someone say that, since she started working the night shift, she had heard the patients talking about this Nozaki-san. When someone mentioned Nozaki-san, it was usually to say something positive. One patient even said that Nozaki-san was much better than her at her job, and my aunt wasn't the type to develop professional jealousy. She's honestly so placid and patient, but due to the patients constantly referencing this other doctor or nurse, she decided to make an effort to meet them. She looked through the logs and registers but couldn't find this Nozaki-san anywhere on the sign-in sheets that the doctors and nurses were supposed to sign when they started their shifts. As far as she knew, there was no one working on her ward by that name. But since she was still relatively new to her role, she guessed that there must have been some senior doctors and nurses working the ward that she hadn't met yet, so she didn't think much of it. After making sure the elderly man was back lying down in his bed, she returned to the nurse's station. A senior nurse was there, and she and my aunt entered into some casual conversation. My aunt used that opportunity to bring up the enigmatic Nozaki-san. She said the senior nurse froze for a couple of seconds. She said that you could have heard a pin drop on that ward, and then turned to my aunt with a very troubled look on her face. Well, it's interesting that you mention Nozaki-san. She used to work here until about a year ago. She took her own life. This kind of thing comes up every once in a while for some reason. My aunt was floored by that. She said that it chilled her to the core, but then she hoped that it was some kind of mistake. Perhaps the nurse had misheard her or something. So then my aunt brought up the conversation that she had with the elderly man. The nurse then said, that happens here a lot lately. My aunt was surprised by this flippant and curt response. The nurse apparently had a stony expression as she said it. My aunt never forgot that exchange, and since that night, she continued to hear the name Nozaki-san on the ward, especially on her night shifts. It wasn't just the elderly man, but also young male patients and even children. Every time she heard that name, she felt uneasy. These patients were talking about someone who was no longer here as if though they were still working at the hospital. It didn't feel right. It was as if though they could still see Nozaki-san, as if she had never left. My aunt considered quitting her job because she was so creeped out by what was happening. But instead of quitting, she grew into her role and adapted to life on the ward. Soon, that uneasy feeling and the fear that she felt started to fade. She still heard the name Nozaki-san on the ward, but didn't get creeped out like she used to. She just thought to herself, oh, here we go again. She thought about it differently, too. Since Nozaki-san was a senior nurse who used to work the wards, maybe her spirit is still present to watch over her patients. Maybe it didn't need to be creepy. She went forward trying to think of it as a positive thing. As I was listening to the story my aunt was telling me, I thought, that's a nice story. Maybe all ghosts aren't really all that bad. And I was smiling as my aunt continued. My aunt noticed my smile, and she nodded at me and smiled back too and said, yeah, I was smiling like that too when I came to that realization. But then I found out something pretty disturbing. All the patients who asked me about Nozaki-san or if she was working that night after a couple of days they would pass away. It seemed as if though seeing her or talking about her was an incredibly bad omen. 
It was a signal that the end was coming. I don't know. There's something about that that seems so sinister. Like Nozaki-san was that hospital's grim reaper. When I was little, my family went on vacation every year. One of our relatives had a villa, and we used to travel across the country every summer and spend time there. It was great. I made lots of great memories with my family there, but I want to share a disturbing experience I had one night. I was about 10 or 11 when this happened. The villa was pretty deep in the mountains. There was no electricity, and there weren't too many other people in the area. It was a great place to spend a relaxing summer. On the fourth day of our annual stay, my parents decided that they wanted to go to karaoke. I didn't want to because I was so tired from hiking in the mountains. They said that I could get food there, and that won me over. The karaoke place was literally in the middle of a field halfway down the mountain pass. I guessed that we were there for about two hours or so. I looked at the clock, and it said it was 11 p.m., I was really wrestling with my own drowsiness now. The karaoke room was really loud. We had our own private room, so it was just my family in there. My dad saw how tired I was, and I guess he was kind of annoyed at my complaining. He said, Why don't you go sleep in the car? I thought that that wouldn't be a bad idea, so he gave me the keys and I headed back to the car park alone. It was really dark out there, and I remember the sound of crickets chirping in the distance. I got in the car, and all of a sudden, I didn't feel sleepy anymore. I felt strangely awake. Since I was no longer drowsy, I got bored pretty quickly, so I picked up the flashlight we had in the car. I was absent-mindedly shining it all around, and I aimed it at this other car which was parked in the car park. It was right next to our family car. I don't know how I didn't notice it before. I flicked the flashlight over the windows, and I noticed a figure in the car. I thought that it would be rude to shine the light in that person's eyes, so I moved the flashlight off the car, and then I just turned it off. I thought that that had annoyed them, so I did what any kid would do to try and avoid trouble in my situation. I pretended to be asleep. Through half-closed eyes, I noticed that the person in the car was looking my way. I couldn't make out their face, but I knew they were looking at me. It made me nervous. Something was off. I realized that the person in the car next to ours hadn't moved for a while. It was like a mannequin was sat in the car. I was sure that it was a person. Well, it looked like a human in the car. It didn't seem like my eyes were playing tricks on me. I felt a chill on my back. I really didn't like it in the car anymore. I made the decision to leave. Until the moment I felt like I needed to get out of there, the person in the car hadn't moved a muscle, but as soon as I decided to go, the figure slowly began to turn to face me more directly just the person's head, not their body. I was unable to move. It was like I was glued to the spot. Since I had been sat in the car for a while, my eyes had grown accustomed to the dark. I could now begin to make out the contours of the person in the car beside me. The head turned very slowly. The tension was unbearable as I still couldn't move. When the head turned about halfway towards me, I felt my spine stiffen like ice. The face of that person in the car was in a keloid state. The face was ruined with red raw scars, scars so enlarged that they engulfed the features of the face. I couldn't make out the eyes or the nose. I focused every ounce of my energy into running, but I still couldn't move. Sweat was teeming down my forehead. Tears began to well in the corner of my eyes, yet I could not free myself. Now that I'm older, the only thing that I can describe that feeling as is sleep paralysis. Yet I was wide awake. At one point, I was convinced I was dreaming. I kept repeating in my mind, wake up, wake up. But I couldn't. I couldn't wake up because I wasn't asleep. And this was really happening. I managed to close my eyes, and I kept them as tightly shut as I could. I don't know how long passed, maybe four or five minutes, and then I opened my eyes. I saw that scarred face staring right at me. 
I have no memory of that night, save for that reddened face peering at me. I was shaken awake by my dad. I told him what happened, and he suspected that I just had had a nightmare. He didn't seem all that interested. I was convinced that it was real, though. I didn't let it go. I made a bit of a scene in the car park. It was very traumatizing for me. I must have been in a state because my mother went back to the karaoke place to ask if there was anyone in the car park earlier. A few moments later, the owner of the place came out with my mother. She looked concerned and she knelt beside the car and asked me very cautiously, What did the person look like? I guessed that the owner of the place wanted to make sure that there was no troublemakers in the area. I felt the pressure as the adults awaited my answer. I said that there was a person in the car next to our car and they were staring at me. The car had since gone so we couldn't establish who the owner was. They asked me to describe the person and I said that they had terrible red scars all over their face and they were sat in the car next to ours. I was absorbed in giving as much detail as I possibly could. I barely noticed that the owner of the karaoke place was crying. She paused and cleared her throat and spoke in a weak voice. <laughs> I think you saw my daughter. She took her own life right in this car park. She set her car alight and sat in there four years ago. We were all in stunned silence. She felt comfortable speaking about what had happened. She went on to tell us that her daughter had been relentlessly bullied at school. It had gone on for years, and she had hid it from her family. To her, nothing could be done about the bullying, so she decided to take a different, fatal course of action. I was so sad to hear this. It was crushing. I have never felt such weight of oppressive loneliness. Something she said jogged my memory because I was suddenly able to remember something that happened before I fainted. I remembered that I heard a voice and I will never forget it for as long as I live. I only heard three words. Three words spat forth from the past to the present. And those words were, I hate them. I hope her soul can find peace one day. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday and Wednesday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button over here on YouTube to hear the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember... I was walking in an enchanted forest... And the wind was blowing with fear. I want to shout out to Bella, Lynn, Leopold H., Anaya Fraze, Miss Jamie, Miss Peachy, Scabity Toilet. <laughs>